Hey everyone, Cursed Deck Builder here, making our way to 10,000 decks assisted, and oh boy, do I have something really, really fun for you. Or maybe really, really unfun. One of our viewers, Andrew, has uh, supported the channel to bring one of their deck lists to the top of the queue, but it, what they did was give me the selection between three decks to look at. And I saw this Ishai Timna anti-stacks deck and immediately fell in love. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. It's like the accumulation of everything I like to do in Commander in the meanest way possible. So thank you so much, Andrew. This is, ah, oh, this is so good. I'm so excited. I still have additions, but I am gonna gush about how amazing this deck is. Let me read what Andrew sent to me. They said, Esper anti-stacks uh, slash Esper good stuff in a shy and Timna. No budget deck, deck is mostly proxies. They say, what happens if I put every single Ristic Study, Smothering Tithe, and Smugglers, Smugglers Share type effects in a single deck? That's the question I asked when I made this deck. Somewhat surprisingly, it actually plays pretty well, and I've won a couple games with it through combat with Ashai or alternate win cons. I call the deck anti-stacks because I specifically want my opponents to be playing the game as much as they can so I can reap the benefits of them playing spells, drawing cards, etc. Looking for suggestions either on cards I may have missed in the theme or additional synergies to help out the cards I already have. Excellent. Just so, so, so excellent. I can't even begin to say how much I love it. And in the moment here, I have found another card that I'm typing up. This is so fun. I am, okay, I'm a bad person, but I love these kind of effects. Ristic Study, Smothering Tide. I love pestering my opponents, being as annoying as possible, and just mm, reaping the benefits of your opponents just trying to play a game of magic. And there's not a lot of circles that I can bring this kind of deck into, but at least here I can just gush about it under the pretense that I'm trying to help the deck and not just tell you how much I love this strategy. <laughs> so I highly, highly recommend going into the video description below, opening up the deck list that we're going to be taking a look at, and just seeing the horror, oh my god, the wonderful horror of this deck. I have some suggestions of things that I think are missing and things that'll make the deck meaner, but I leave it to you guys to find out what this deck needs. This deck is vulnerable to certain specific kinds of hate, and I don't necessarily want, I will suggest one card about that, um, but I don't want to overly fix that problem. So I want uh, viewers to be able to find that problem and understand that decks like this sometimes need a weakness. So, before we get any further, Timna the Weaver, Ishai, Ujitai, Dragon Speaker, who are these commanders and why are they commanders of our anti stacks deck? Well, pretty straightforward before I get into them, it's important to know that these partner commanders that came out during the time of, let's say, oh, I forget which commander set they came out in, but these were the four color commander partners. This was when partner was first created and immediately realized to be way, way too powerful. Almost all of these commanders are just really, really good, but we're looking at one of the strongest ones here in Timna. So any deck that uses partner commanders is often using them for their sheer power and the colors that they provide, and not usually themed around them directly. So let's look at Timna first, even though she's on the right. Timna the Weaver is in three mana, white and black, human cleric, 2-2. Two, two. She is by far, I would say pretty close, but in my heart, the strongest partner available. I might be biased because I really like black white, but <laughs> she has lifelink and partner, and her main ability is at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, you may pay X life, where X is the number of opponents that were dealt combat damage this turn. If you do, draw X cards. Very, very straightforwardly, you use this card, you attack your opponents, you get damage in, and then on your post-combat phase, you draw that many cards. This is so, so strong. The skin with the right setups, on the turn she comes out, you can guarantee drawing two cards for two life. Just fantastic. 
Really, really don't underestimate her. I tend to run her in the 99 of decks because I don't tend to like this kind of partner deck, but here it just makes so much sense to run her. On the other hand, we have Ishai, Ujitai Dragon Speaker. And Ishai is kind of a weirder card because I would consider them to be definitely a bit weaker, but we're playing them for the blue color. So if you wanted to replace them with another blue partner and keep Timna, I would completely get that. But what Ashid Ashai does is they're a 1 1 flying bird monk creature for four mana in blue and white. And whenever an opponent casts a spell, put a plus one plus one counter on Ashai. So this is just kind of a long-term win con. You play a shy when you have an, a bunch of extra mana, and you just leave them around as they grow and grow, and you slowly beat down your opponents with it. It's not great, and I think there's probably better blue partners you could put into this pairing. That's a lot of peas. Blue partners you can put into this pairing. Mm. But for now, we're going to keep a shy because it is interesting. It is it is fun to have this kind of like damage-based win condition, but we're gonna see what the other options are. And with all that, let's take a look at our wonderful commander deck. Ah, oh, it is so, so good. It's so good. Our creatures, I'm just gonna go over them. Esper Sentinel is attacks whenever a spell is cast. Giver and Mother of Ruins protect your creatures. Archivist of Ogma punishes draw, uh, searching your deck. For your opponents, Fairy Mastermind draws you more cards as your opponents draw cards. Ghostly Pilfer draws you cards when your opponents cast spells outside of their hand. Ledger Shredder draws cards on every second spell. Lotho creates treasures on every second spell. Clever Impersonator is a copy of any card in this deck, which is just really, really good. Grim Hireling is, uh, makes treasures on attack, but we're going to get back to him. Spark Devil is also a copy of any card in a deck like this. Council of Four works on seconds as well. I, I'm just gonna, oh, it's so good. It's so, so good. In the enchantments, we've got Mystic Remora and where are you? Ristic Study to draw cards on spells cast. Monologue Tax to draw and create treasures, uh, treasures on second spells. Smuggler's Share to once again do things with seconds. And Smothering Tithe to give us treasure as people draw cards. Those are the main ones. There's a few others here and there, but those are the ones that I believe are the strongest. Ah, oh, and they're so good. They're so good. You just play these out normally and you just ruin your opponent's lives. I, I just, I, I love it so, so much. But let's be critical. Let's see what we can do. Let's look at the mana curve to begin with. And the mana curve is honestly really, really nice. With a deck like this that's tuned to be very, very powerful, it's natural for the curve to kind of end up this way because we're trying to play as many strong one and two mana spells as possible. And with that in mind, I'm gonna suggest a few things that I think need to be changed in general and then my suggestions after the fact. So one of the things is we're kind of low on creatures. We have a few other really strong creatures that I think are worth running, but in general, we have a lot of, especially with Timna, we are we benefit more when our creatures can attack. So having a few more attacking creatures is going to be very useful. But also, our creatures work really well together, so the more that we have on the field, the, the worse the taxation effects are. But the downside of that is that it really does open us up to board clears, which we have some solutions for, but not an infinite number of solutions. So I'd like to go up on the number of the number of creatures that we have and what i'd like to go down on is our artifacts we have a lot of ramp and i think we have too much ramp ramp in a deck like this is pretty strong with a few circumstances now if we were in cdh it would be obvious that the next step would be just really powerful zero and one mana ramp but that's not what we're doing and that's not what i'm going to suggest what ramp like this is really good for, and I would play, and right now, let's just see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's 14 ramp cards. I think that's too many. I think you can cut down to like eight really easily. Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, and then three Talismans and three Signets feel like it should be enough. 
And if you want nine, Felwar Stone would be the next one. And Thought Vessel could be 10 if you really wanted the no maximum hand size, but I feel that's a bit unnecessary. I think, I think something to be considering in a deck like this is that you're going to be drawing so, so, so many cards, and your mana costs are generally low. And though it's good to continue to ramp so you can cast multiple of your spells in a turn, this is too much. If you think of yourself as drawing about two to three cards per turn cycle, all you're going to think you're drawing enough lands that you're going to be dropping, dropping a land drop every single turn. And if you're doing that, the ramp is mainly unneeded at that point. Ramp is really good at getting you ahead early, but at a certain point, it's just dead cards in your hand. And you have, I'd say, 14 ramp cards, and that's just, that's just too many. We can definitely cut down on those and still get away with casting all of our spells on perk. A lot of our most powerful spells are between 1 and 3 mana, after all. With Smothering Tithe being one of the very few cards that I really, really want to ramp in, because turn 3 Smothering Tithe is really, really good. However, that's a difficult thing, and I don't think necessary, since it's so hard to get Smothering Tithe, I don't think the mana ramp is the thing that's holding you back here. So, and by getting Smothering Tithe, I mean into your opening hand. So, with that in mind, I, I would like to cut down on some artifacts. And then, I, I do also want to talk about Swiftfoot Boots and Lightning Greaves. These also kind of stand out. I know I, know I talked about how we've got uh, a really nice collection of creatures that, you know, that we want to attack with. Just adding a card. Uh, that we want to attack with and get, like get like damage going and keep attacking and getting Timna triggers, but I don't think we want them that badly to play both Swiftfoot Boots and Lightning Greaves. Lightning Greaves is obviously good because it gives us Shroud and we could put it on some of our creatures to give a lot of protection. But with that in mind, I would I also want to suggest the fact that um well the fact that it's zero mana to equip is really what saves it here, and Swift Boots is not good enough. But otherwise, like, what am I attaching Lightning Greaves to, really? And I think it's Ishai, really. I want to attach Lightning Greaves to Ishai, but I'm not doing it for the haste, right? Ishai grows over time, so you're really just attaching Lightning Greaves for the Shroud. And that feels a little bad. With that in mind, I personally would cut both the boots. But if you want to keep one, I'd keep the Lightning Greaves. I think you're not gonna, I think you're fine if your creatures die. Like, you, your, your deck is going to be hated out of the game. If you sit down with this and everyone realizes what they're, you're doing, they're going to do everything they can to destroy you, and rightfully so. And to be clear, I think that's a feature, not a bug, because this is the kind of deck I wanna play where everyone hates you immediately and tries to hate you out of the game. So with that in mind, I don't think the Greaves and the Boots are either going to work the way you want to, because your opponents will react to the equip, or they're just going to be okay and dead, or dead. Like, I just, I don't see them being very strong. I want to cut down. I don't think we need a lot of artifacts that are here. Likewise, Mind's Eye feels kind of strange here. It's a lot of mana to draw cards when you already have a lot of very, very good card draw. Uh, a lot of, yes, like non-direct card draw, and this is also more non-direct card draw, so it's thematically valid, but it's just, it's not quite there. Five mana and holding up more mana is just a lot, a lot of work. Whereas Consecrated Sphinx kind of does the same thing, you know, it's a draw uh, ability based off of your opponent's draws, while being like easier to cast, easier to interact with, you don't have to hold up mana, it's just a card that people, it's more fun to have this around than Mind's Eye, where you have even more things to worry about. This is a taxing deck on your energy to be playing it. Don't burn yourself out for Mind's Eye, when you could be burning yourself out for monologue task, tax, which is so much more fun. All right, so Mind's Eye, and this, these are the artifacts, uh, going to enchantments, a card that I think doesn't really belong is Revel in Riches. Uh, I see why it's here. I have a really strong opinion on Revel in Riches, and it's that I don't like it. Um, it is either a card that wins 
or does generally nothing. And I, I find that kind of whiplash doesn't do well in a deck like this, where you need it to be really, really strong because your opponents are already gunning from you from the word go. And with that in mind, I think this just ain't gonna cut it. I, I don't think you're gonna hit 10 treasures. I don't think you're even gonna get that many treasures off of it normally. It just, it just feels like this could be something else. And honestly, if you won with these 10 treasures, do you really feel like it's in a win with a deck like this? Like this deck is so much more fun the longer and longer the game goes on, which is why I don't want to suggest like any Thassa's Oracle win con. Like I don't want a win con <laughs> that takes more than like, I don't know, three cards or something or a lot of time. Like Approach this of the Second Sun is great here. Absolutely love it. But Revel and Riches has this kind of dangerous uh, you could just win the game at any time aspect to it, and I don't think it's in theme with the rest of the deck. I'll leave it to you. Some people really like this card, but it's not a card I particularly enjoy. Going through our instants, I feel like uh, Void Rend and Utter End, Void Rend and Utter End, uh, stand out here as being the weakest cards here. Utter End is just okay the exile is fine i think you'd be happier with fact fracture which exiles any non-creature non-land permanent and i think that's fair oh i guess it doesn't get battles because i think this one specifically says what it gets uh let's see fracture target artifact enchantment or planeswalker okay so it hits three really relevant things and it oh it destroys it doesn't exile so maybe it's not as good, but four mana for Utter End is a lot. If you like its utility, you could play Vindicate. If you like its exile, you could play Vanishing Verse, uh, which once again doesn't hit everything, but it's just much nicer for mana. And I think my internet has decided to give up on this because I'm too happy about this deck, so we'll come back to it later. Uh, Void Ren, likewise, feels... It's just really, really tough on the mana. Here, let's just look at Vanishing Verse for a second. Exile target, mono color permanent. Uh, Void Ren just feels particularly... I don't know, just a little weak. The mana cost is hard to pay. It just destroys a permanent. It's like a Vindicate that doesn't hit lands. It's instant speed, which is nice, and it can't be countered, which is somewhat relevant. But for all of that, I, I just... I see it as a weaker card. I think I think you'd just be happier with like a lot of the time board clear or some other effect that's just easier to cast than Void Rend. I don't know. I, I'm just not a big fan of this card. But you are an Esper, and this is like the cool Esper spell nowadays, so I do understand why it's in here. So I won't be too hard on that, but other other end can just be reduced in mana pretty easily. I'm gonna have a, a few more instances to suggest, so we will come back to this. Sorceries. Uh, love Torment of Hailfire, always a good win condition. Love Praetor's Grasp, always, always underused of how strong it is. Oh, here's Vindicate. I was talking about Vindicate, and it's right here. Um, with that in mind, I would probably cut the Vindicate uh, or the Utter End, just keep one of them. But probably you don't need the Vindicate either if it's already here. I think you have better inclusions. Hmm. I'm going to give this one a thought, some thought, but for now I'm going to say... Just one of the two. Rite of Replication is obviously incredibly hilarious with a number of your creatures, but otherwise feels kind of like the third copy of Spark Double, which is the second copy of Clever Impersonator. Uh, I don't like it as much. I think the ceiling is really, really fun, but the floor is pretty low, so I don't know how much I'm gonna say that this is a great card here. Approach is fantastic. Clone Legion is really, really funny here. Uh, and Rise of the Dark Realms is equally funny, but I think I would cut the Rise and keep the Clone. I think Clone the Legion is just pretty hilarious in a deck like this, and you can use it against your opponents, or you can use it on yourself in certain setups. That could be really, really fun. You'll lose legendary creatures, which is too bad, but it is a really, really, really funny card. Whereas Rise of the Dark Realms doesn't really fit the rest of the theming of the deck. You don't have a lot of board clears. You don't have a lot of ways to dump a bunch of cards in your opponent's graveyards. And so you're not really going to get much out of this, especially considering you only have 14 creatures at the moment. Speaking of creatures, my cuts here are Wandering Archaic. I don't really like this card. 
I think this was also, I spoke earlier today about the MDC Goldfish. They did a, a um, what do you call it? They did a podcast about cards they thought were really good, but turned out to be not so great. And Wandering Archaic was on that list. And I think I'm inclined to agree. That being said, the fact that it further taxes your opponents is interesting, but I just, this is too much for that effect. There's other cards that we can add in here to have that tax, to force them to pay it, um, or force them to not pay it and you get a spell. But Wandering Archaic, in a lot of ways, is just not going to be the one they care about, right? In fact, considering how good a board clear is against a deck like this, and Wandering Archaic does nothing against board clears, I'm inclined to say this is one of the weakest of this effect in the deck, and I would be inclined to cut it. Likewise, uh, Grim Hireling just feels a little weird here. This card is once again really, really good when you can hit multiple players with multiple creatures, just like Timna, and you are just not running enough creatures to do so. Now you might say, but Cursed, you like Timna, but you don't like Grim Hireling, they do almost the same thing. Why? What, what's going on? Well, Grim Hireling being four mana to start with is a bit much. And the other thing is the fact that it just cr it creates treasure tokens, which is something you have an abundance of. Card draw is always, always good, but at a certain time, more treasure isn't going to change anything, right? And for that, I'm just a little harder on Grim Hireling. It's close. It's just there's so many other good cards in this deck that it kind of sticks out as... I don't know, uh, the weakest link, let's say. All right, let's talk about inclusions that I think need to be here. And we're gonna start with cards that I think generally should be in here, and then we're gonna move on to some, a few additions that I think are interesting, and then some mean additions after the fact. So, let's talk about things that punish our opponents. Orcish Bowmasters, uh, is a very expensive card, very good in modern right now, but I want you to be playing it in your commander deck. If you're allowed to proxy, proxy this card immediately. It is so, so, so much fun. It's really good with wheels, but it's really good just as another punishing thing that makes your opponents, you know, benefits when your opponents are playing the game. Uh, I will say for what it's worth, the fact that this deck doesn't run any wheels is kind of funny to me because of how strong the deck is with wheels, but it's more fun if it doesn't, and I get that. Because if you run wheels, you're just doing it yourself. The whole point of the deck is to force your opponents to trigger your stuff. If you're triggering it for them, it's kind of like, oh, okay, all right, well, I guess you could have done this all by yourself. But that's my opinion. If you wanted to, putting a wheel or two in here would be incredibly powerful. But Orgish Bowmasters represents one point of damage and a growing creature every time they draw an extra card, and that's going to ramp up incredibly, incredibly fast. Another card that kind of punishes people for doing things is Deep, Deep, Known, uh, Deep Gnome Terramancer. That says whenever your opponents fetch or, or play land ramp, basically play a land without playing it, you get a planes tapped on the battlefield. Just like the rest of these suggestions I'm giving in this section, these are all creatures. And the reason I, and like the main benefit is that you want these creatures to be able to attack and able to, able to kind of progress your game plan that way while having a punishing effect or a beneficial effect at the same time. With that, Deep Gnome Terramancer is really, really good, especially if your opponents also get to proxy cards and they all have fetch lands, which means this will trigger much more often. You're generally going to be happy with this ability. It's only once a turn, and even if it triggers just once, it's probably pretty good. I think I would play two mana in white, flash, two, two, put a planes tapped on your battlefield. So even if triggering once is probably gonna be enough, but then it's kind of frustrating for your opponents because they need to think about it all the time. Speaking of taxation, Leonin Arbiter is very, very funny here. Unfortunately, it's going to hurt you as well, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't play it. As long as, since you know it's in your hand, you can play around it, and what it does is it forces your opponents to continue to overthink, overpay, spend all their mana in order to do things they want, and if they're spending mana to search with their tutors or their fetch lands, then they don't have mana to pay Ristic Studies and the like. So 
this is another way to kind of aggravate the tax without necessarily locking them out of the game. This is the same reason I am not actually suggesting Dranith Magistrate, even though I so, so desperately want to because it's one of my favorite cards in a deck like this, because part of the idea is not to stop them from doing things, but to kind of put them into situations where they have to overpay and are running out of mana for other things. So that in mind, I think Leonid and Arbiter is very, very strong here and an incredibly cheap card, all that's considered. After the fact, uh, Thalia not being in this deck is criminal. Uh, this is just another thing that forces your opponents to run out of mana to play your, pay your optional effects because Thalia is not an optional effect. Now, she affects you too, which can be kind of rough, but generally, once again, because of extra treasures and extra effects, you should be ahead on mana and free to kind of use her uh, proactively to hinder your opponents more than you. As I always say with Thalia, like, one, Thalia is just one of the great best white creatures in Commander, period. But also, if you ever doubt that statement I just said, play Thalia and just count how much mana she makes your opponents pay. Just put it on the side with a notepad and figure out exactly the amount of mana it adds or it subtracts from your opponent's mana pools and if that doesn't convince you unless she's removed right away of course but if that doesn't convince you, oh if she's removed right away count that mana in there because they had to spend the mana to kill her <laughs> but if that doesn't convince you on how good she is i don't know what will speaking of two mana white creatures selfless spirit is kind of in a really interesting place in a deck like this where i do really like it because you are very very weak to board clears and the cleric itself is a fantastic enabler for timna because it has evasion i think you'd be pretty happy with this inclusion and it gives you a nice bit of defense against the thing that defeats your deck the most i teased this earlier but i think board clears are really really strong against you especially with your creature setup and so having at least one protection from it is nice, but you don't have to feel like you have to overindulge in that direction. Going up on three mana, two cards that work as Timna copies. What's that in the air? Is it my favorite commander? It is. Brina the Demagogue works so, so, oh, so good in a deck like this for a number of reasons. One, Brina works like Timna. You play Brina, you attack, you immediately start drawing cards. Actually, you know what I'm gonna say? Brina, Brina feels like a, a combination of your commanders together with a flying creature that grows in size and draws you cards. So Brina draws you cards off of attacks against your opponents and gives you plus one, plus one counters as well that you can put on any creature. Then your opponents on their turn can draw cards which will trigger several of your abilities and as they draw those cards, your creatures get bigger and bigger. I will sing the praises of this card all day, but what's important to know is this works as a both like on theme piece that works as a like a redundancy with Timna and triggers extra draws, while at the same time it creates a win condition because you can just dump those plus one plus one counters onto Brina or literally anything else and you will be surprised how big these creatures get. I found like in a decent turn cycle where you can attack two opponents, then uh, your opponents each attack one opponent, that is like, let's say that's about five triggers. Let's reduce that. Say you can only attack one opponent instead of both two opponents that have higher than the lowest life total. That's four triggers. Excuse me. That's eight plus one plus one counters in a turn cycle and i think that's that's really really impressive so it can get higher than that in certain setups your opponent with the least life can attack the other two players to draw to get two more triggers so these creatures grow really really quickly and you don't really need to pay attention to brina so that's really really nice our third copy of brina timna abilities is gix yogmoth praetor Gix is really, Gix is just the same thing basically that I said, where you have a card advantage engine like Timna, except for it actually goes higher because it's per creature, not per opponent. 
And then alternatively, he provides a win condition where if you end up with a hand of 10 cards, you can pay the seven, throw your hand away and get 10 cards off your opponent's deck. You pick the opponent with the, you know, the juiciest, strongest deck and you're probably going to win the game because you're casting like, what, seven to eight spells, ideally, depending on how many lands are flipped. Really, really strong. Remember, as people say, you win in Commander by doing the most things, and free spells are really good because they enable you, like they add to the counter without, you know, punishing your mana or being a strain on your mana. So those are the kind of like, creature-based things I want to add that I think just kind of belong in a strategy like this. There's a few more. They get a little meaner at a certain point, and I didn't want to, like, put too many, like, non-creature spells like Thalia or Thorn of Amethyst effects into it, because at a certain point, it is just stacks, and that's not what you're going for. And Leon and Arbiter and Thalia are close to that edge of being just stacks. But Leon and Arbiter, I think... I think it's fair enough because you it is using your opponent's mana and Thalia is also just just one ah, one version of this ability is fine. If you have several Thalias, se sorry, or several Thorn of Amethyst style cards, then it becomes too much, but just one is generally fine and your opponents aren't going to be in a situation where they're locked out of the game. All right, the next few additions that I have are not going to make the deck stronger. What they're going to do is they're going to make the deck meaner. And so I will leave this to you to decide how it works. What is the ideal situation of a deck like this, right? You've got Mystic Remora out, you've got Ristic Study out, you've got Esper Sentinel and other cards, Ledger Shredder, Lotho. You've got all these cards that trigger on your opponent's casts or their second casts or as they do things, right? And they cast a spell. Why are you countering that spell? Counter spell is a bit much here. Wouldn't you rather remand it? And this is, this is what I want to do. So remand and reprieve, nice and easy, off the top. Cards that return the spells back to your opponent's hand. Because just make them do it again, right? They've had to pay extra mana or ha you've had extra triggers because they've done something. They've paid and dealt with the triggers. Instead of countering it, put it back in their hand and tell them to do it again. Ah, oh, it's so good. It's just, it's just so, so mean. So you got to be careful with these kind of effects. They also fall off really quickly. Remand and Repra Reprieve are the strongest ones. After which, most directly, we have Unsubstantiate, which just returns a spell or creature to its owner's hand, which at higher levels does have a lot more utility than you'd think, so I do particularly like it. Uh, Narset's Reversal does a version of this ability by returning an instant or sorcery to their hand and giving you a copy, which is a lot of advantage, especially in Counterspell Wars, but to an extent, it does have, like, Blue Blue's a lot, to not counter the spell, so I don't know how much I love it. And finally, at four mana, Venser does this as well, but you get to keep a creature, which this deck is less interested in. You don't have blink effects, but it's Venser. Like, come on, what a fun time. <laughs> oh man. Looking at someone in the eye, when they've paid so many things to let your spell go through, they've watched you loot, they've watched you put a treasure in play, they've watched you do everything you can before their spell has it resolved, and then you just reprieve it, you just cast Venser and put it back in their hand, this this might end friendships. I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's so mean and I love it, I love it so, so much. So I don't think you should play all of them, but Remand and Reprieve for sure, you can play with no, I think, little to downside. And then if you're even meaner, you could play Mana Tide or uh, its original version with Force Spike. Both of these cards are just really, really mean by in and of themselves, but with so much taxation, they become incredibly reasonable because your opponents are gonna be spending all their mana to do something, and you're going to be spending one to get rid of it. And they're gonna think to themselves, if only I didn't pay that Ristic Study cost. Ah, oh, seriously. 
People won't talk to you if you play this deck too well. <laughs> All right, last two additions that I think are interesting. When I looked into your protective spells, I forgot to mention this, but Ghostly Prison is one that sticks out, as, at, out at me as being kind of meh. It does what you want it to in a deck like this because you are attracting so, so much attention against your opponents because my goodness, are they gonna try to put you in the ground incredibly fast. Unless they're playing like combo decks, which they're just gonna try to ignore you and knock you out of the game by comboing off, but you're playing counter spells, so you should be fine with that. So, Ghostly Prison is really good at actually kind of slowing them down, taxing them a bit more, and so is Propaganda as they are copies of the card, but I don't know to what degree I like them. They're very, very defensive here, they're not proactive, and as I always say with these cards, your opponents will either, will either not play them, or they will just pay the cost when it's going to destroy you. So they're only kind of soft power until it doesn't matter anymore. I do obviously think they're here because they're on theme of further taxing your opponents and making it harder to kind of attack into you. And what I do is probably get rid of one of them. And I think a more fun card, much like ever watching Threshold, is Cunning Rhetoric. Cunning Rhetoric I thought was going to be good. Uh, and it's been okay, but at this kind of power level, it's really, really good. Because your opponents have to attack you, and you start stealing their spells, which are, I'm assuming, of similar power level. And with that, you're going to get pretty far with an ability like this. It's just a little more fun, is basically what I'm suggesting. Um, I don't know to what degree it's going to be better. I think probably keeping both Ghostly Prison and Propaganda is the safer bit or taking one of them out and putting just like Toxic Deluge or Board Clear is also gonna be good for when you're like facing down three boards at once and you need to reset it. But Cunning Rhetoric is just a lot of fun in a deck like this, so I'm suggesting it here anyways. And then finally, I'm going to suggest the card that I feel like nowadays a lot of my you know videos end with, and that is Unearth. You are playing a black commander that is less than four mana, you should play Unearth. But it's even more true in a deck like yours because there are just so, so many really, really valid targets for you to play in, to, to reanimate, right? Anything from Lotho to Esper Sentinel is fair game and all of these cards are very, very good. Timna is very strong to get back. And as always, if you just don't want it, you cycle it away and you're pretty happy. Alternatively, because we are proxying and budget isn't a concern, reanimate is pretty free to put in here as well. It'll do the same thing, but hit any target for life, including your opponent's targets, which is pretty, pretty good. All right, I have gone quite a bit of time on this deck. This deck is so, so much fun. I can't even begin to talk about how much I love it. Um, I don't know how long you're gonna have friends as you play a deck like this. Uh, I hope your group is just very, very much so enamored or at least accepting of a strategy like this because it can be really, really mean, especially with the additions of like Remand and the such to kind of really punish them for just trying to play the game at all. And I love that because I'm a bad person, but if you don't love that and you're looking at this and you're like, I need to unsubscribe from Cursed, uh, he's clearly got something going on that I don't want to deal with. Don't worry, not all decks need to be like this. Uh, this is fun in an appropriate kind of playgroup. Please, please, do not just bring this to, uh, you know, your local game store for pickup commander with a bunch of uh, strangers, unless you can describe to them what this deck is and they're all okay with it. And even then, if there's any new players, please do not bring this deck. They're going to hate Commander. <laughs> but if you have a group that really likes playing strong decks, really likes the interaction and planning it out, and really likes the game of magic, you know, with all triggers and like strategy and politics, this is such a cool deck to be bringing. It will bring a bit of a, how do I put this? A suck into the into the playgroup because a lot of attention will have to go towards one deck 
but that's kind of the point, you know? This is the deck that either grinds everyone into the ground, you know, they might concede before actually being defeated, or it's going to be taken out incredibly early while your opponents like quickly gang up to take you out as fast as possible. And as long as you're fine with that, um, I, think, I think that's good. I hope this deck assist video was useful to you. And Andrew, this is such a... Uh, thank you for sending me this deck. It's really made my day. Um, I'm going to take another look at the other decks that you have, maybe for another time. But right now, man, I, I just, I love this. I'm so glad you've, you've introduced this to my life. I've always thought about these kind of like mid-range decks where you just play all of these abilities, but I never foolishly thought about what if the point was to play these abilities, and I love it. If you'd like to send me another draft of this deck or any deck, if you'd like to send me a fair dinosaur tribal deck to wash the palette clean after this hard, like this mean, mean deck, there is a link in the video description below that you can do so. And if, like Andrew, you would like your deck to be the next deck I look at, there is a link down there to do so. And as always, if you want to like, comment, subscribe, do that whole thing, absolutely, please, please do. Oh, this is amazing. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really, really do love this. And uh, I am so, so happy to see this deck. All right. Good luck with it. <laughs> and uh, hopefully your opponents don't think you're too mean.